I will talk today, um, good afternoon first. Uh, I will talk today about um, concurrent programming with Python and uh, my little experiment I do since one year or so, something like it. Um, so first to introduce myself, I'm uh, doing open source for a living, mostly consulting in database world. Uh, I'm, I'm a CouchDB developer, I'm a member of the PSF, uh, the, a member of the PSF too. And uh, I'm also, in, uh, in Python, I'm also doing the GNECON server. So, okay. First, uh, what is concurrent programming? What, wha what do we call conc uh, concurrent programming? Concurrent programming is, in fact, a way to design a program to uh, launch a collection of, uh, of a computation process that may be uh, executed in parallel. But, um, Running something in parallel is not a uh, requirement to, to do uh, concurrent programming. You can do concurrent programming on one thread, on one process, uh, by switching from one task to the other task uh, in a time sliced way. Or you can do concurrent programming on multiple CPU or multiple machine at the same time. You have basically two ways, uh, maybe three ways, if we if uh, add a flow system uh, to code in concurrent programming. So you have the Cheren memory. This is where we are mostly in Python, uh, which is very convenient for the programmer. You don't care about um, knowing that you are running in a process or another. You are using global variable or not. You are sharing variable between your function without uh, knowing it's running somewhere else on your machine. Um, but it's also very complicated to implement. Uh, you have to take care about locking. Uh, you have a lot of risk to have conflicts when writing on a global variable. Uh, because uh, what does your program every time is checking if it can write to your global variable and um, putting the value in your variable. Uh, the other way is message passing, uh, which is well used in, um, in Erlang and Scala today, which is basically a, a way to say, um, either than having global variable, I have um, one channel or one message that I pass to my function. I don't pass any variable to, uh, from one function to the other. I have only one single channel between uh, two functions. So I can run this channel on multiprocessors. In Erlang, this is the resave. In Scala, uh, resave too. Uh, nowadays, in Python, you have mostly free way. You have free way uh, to do concurrent programming from standard library. You have async, which is uh, what I call just um, an improved select, so you can mostly waiting on your data and uh, when your data is coming, uh, doing some stuff. Uh, but you you are blocking your your code when you are uh, doing you are handling the data you receive or when you want to send it. And yeah, async or is also not uh, uh, really efficient behind in Python. It's only using poll or selects, uh, which are the two slowest ways you can find on Linux on other systems. Uh, the other way are threads, and uh, recently with the uh, introduction with Future, this is kind of interesting API, so you can do, uh, you can send uh, a, f uh, a task on a pool of threads and uh, wait for its visit. Uh, but threads in Python, like I will say later, are mostly uh, useless. Uh, you have only some case that you can use uh, the threads in Python because you have these skills and uh, at one time only one thread can be executed uh, for some model. And the latest and trendy way is AsyncIO. Um, I won't talk more about AsyncIO because we, uh, we already had talk before by Sagul, but just some words. Uh, because it explains why uh, I did my little experiment right after. Uh, AsyncIO is mostly to do asynchronous programming and invented programming. So you are possibly uh, saying, I'm waiting asynchronously for my data and I'm reacting on events which are uh, mostly resaved. I can read, I can write, etc., etc. And then you are doing action. Uh, but whatever we say, our system, even on the core, is not designed like this. Uh, the main API in Linux is resave. Is read, sorry, and write. And this, uh, this is the same kind of API that you have on uh, POSIX wi on Windows. And then you have another level, which is the select, or the poll, or the epoll, or the capol, or the, the other things uh, under Windows. 
which are the basically ways to wait for events. And right when, when you receive your event, you start to read or you start to write. So to um, so AsyncIO for doing for to do, do that is using an event loops. And AsyncIO is different from any modern programming today. Today modern programs like uh, you can do in Go, like you can do in Rust, like you can do in Julia, and, and uh, are doing implicit yielding, where in uh, where with AsyncIO you are doing explicit yielding. You are yielding from. You know where where you are yielding from you know where you are sending your yield, etc. So this is explicitly yielding, where in Go, you don't do any explicit yielding. You're just running a task and passing data to the task. The same in Julia, the same in Rust, and the same in any uh, modern program in language today. Uh, so this is for the standard library. In, um, in the Python world, in the external libraries, you have also two main groups. The groups that is doing implicit yieldings, like G-Event, like eventlet, uh, like evergreen, mostly uh, from Sagul, uh, based on PyUV. I don't know if it's still maintained now, but uh <laughs> yes, <it is. laughs> okay. And uh, the evented library, like Twisted. Twisted is mostly uh, the ancestor of AsyncIO, uh, and uh, a simple example will show you how, how it is um, similar. Um, all the systems that you are to th that you are using today in um, in Python, except stackless, are all using an event loops. G event, uh, eventless are using an event loop behind. Tornado is using an event loop behind. Evergreen is using PyUV, so it's using live UV uh, for for doing the stuff. Uh, Twisted is also using an event loops. They are all using an event loop, and they are all using an event loop that is target in that is targeting mostly I/O operation, read, write, on file descriptor, etc. Except maybe uh, LibUV and uh, async, uh, async IU that have added some other stuff like possibility to uh, wait for an ideal task or, or launch a task later, etc. Uh, but um, at the end, uh, these are all uh, event loop waiting for events and uh, reacting the behind. So here is a simple example of a G-Event program, uh, which is just an echo server. So you are, s uh, you are sending uh, using Telnet or any clients um, over TCP a message and it send back the message. Uh, you can see it uh, that um, G-Event is doing uh, uh, blocking code programming. So uh, you are launching a server listening on uh, 6,000 port. And uh, the socket, the echo function, is waiting for um, connection, reading the stuff and sending back the results. Uh, Evergreen is also doing uh, some kind of blocking code. Uh, you are launching a, a loop at the end, uh, and in, the, in that loop you are putting task or uh, any action. Uh, here we are, put, we are spanning a main function, which is uh, introducing in the loop an event, and the next time the loop uh, will come back, it will execute these events. This is mostly how it works. And uh, so the um, echo server, when it receives a connection, uh, start to read the connection and write the data back to the to the socket. Uh, which is quite different when you are using. Uh, it was G event. Uh, this is twisted. Sorry, not read the title. So in, in Twisted, this is an evented um, action. So you, have a put, uh, you are uh, creating a, a factory uh, which is uh, designing a protocol, which is uh, this protocol is called ECHO. And uh, this protocol does only one thing. When it, it receives data, it's, uh, it's writing back the data to the transport. Uh, so you have the same notion that uh, have been defined uh, sooner uh, in Twisted than in uh, in AsyncIO, so you are designing uh, the transport, which is the TCP, where you are, you are sending the data, and the protocol, which is here an echo, but that could be HTTP or WC. And as you see, you are waiting for, uh, for data uh, before writing, where here we were waiting for a connection, then we are reading, blocking here on read. Behind that, we have an event loop running, waiting for an event read and uh, unlocking your code. Uh, and I think IO is quite the same cause, uh, 
quite normal because um, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, it was polluted by uh, the Tristan uh, view uh, at, the, at the beginning. Uh, so you are launching uh, a server uh, uh, protocol listening uh, uh, on the on the local port uh, seven thousand, and when the data is received, it's writing back to the transport. The only difference, because uh, um, I think EO is more uh, uh, is more advanced and twisted, that you are you can on connection you can act uh, have uh, some. Action. I'm not sure you can do the same in, uh, in Twisted. And you are here setting the transport. Um, so, like I said, all the system that you are uh, that you are using in Python today are all based on an event loop. And I was quite tired about that, uh, where you can have um, pure scheduler running uh, only ba only a running task and switching the task between themselves to, uh, to make your concurrent programming. Uh, like in Go, uh, you, are, you are launching your task in a run queue and uh, executing your task uh, in a blocking manner for, for the programmer, but uh, at the end, you have a concurrent programming. I, I wanted to do the same in Python. And uh, for that, I've, I've written a little library. That uh, The first name of this library was, uh, amusingly, uh, Tulip. I had to rename it, so I renamed it first to Flower, but Flower was taken too. So I renamed it to Offset. And an Offset, I don't know if you know it, this is a small plant that um, is growing on the same plant. And uh, they share the same ADN, but uh, they have also new properties uh, on the new plant, on the same plant. And this is exactly what is Offset. Offset is a library growing on top of Python and adding it its own way to decorate the function. Uh, so, Offset is um, implementing the Go concurrency model in Python, and for that, you have, uh, I will explain um, quickly how it works. Uh, what is the Go concurrency in, in Python in uh, Go? Sorry, and this is mostly uh, based on the way uh, uh, Go is executing process and sharing data between processes. And in in uh, Go, you have the Go routine, which are t uh, which are what is called in asyncio task, uh, which is a real coroutine. A real coroutine is a, a small part, a small bit of code uh, that is ex uh, added to a stack on the same thread, so you can run multiple ex um, pro uh, execution at the same time by stacking the execution time. And so you have a run queue on each thread, and you are switching from one task to the other to execute your code in, par in a parallel manner. Um, a Go routine in, in, uh, in Go don't know about, uh, about each other, which means that when you are talking to a Go routine, you can't share a variable like you can do in Python. You don't share any vari uh, variable. You are opening a channel between two Go routines and passing data to the channel. You are sending data on the channel and receiving data on the channel. And this is this action of sending and receiving that will switch to the scheduler uh, executing in the next Go routine and going back uh, when it's received and waiting. And you can send multiple channels and select, uh, like you can do on IO, waiting on multiple channels to execute code. Uh, doing that in Go is quite more easy than doing that in Python, because in, uh, in Go, you can launch threads. And you can, when uh, you want to block on a, on a Go routine, because you are receiving some data, so you are making a blocking size call. Uh, then you are just uh, putting back uh, your, your go routine out of the queue, of the range queue, and executing another or go routine on, on new threads. You are just launching a new thread. You can't do that in Python. Or at least it, it doesn't mean anything, because the threads in Python are mostly, uh, you only execute one thread at a time. So uh, this is not really interesting to, to, to lock um, a go routine on, on a thread. Um, but because the I/O operation happened in the background, uh, running an uh, I/O operation on a thread uh, makes sense. So instead of blocking a thread and uh, uh, let, let uh, go routing on the on a one thread, I'm running all the routing on the main thread. And when I have a blocking call, a blocking size call, I'm launching a new thread. I'm launching this I/O operation in a new thread. 
Uh, offset also does uh, implicit yielding, so you don't know that uh, that you are yielding from you are that you don't know that you are doing in synchronous operation for you. This is like you are doing your everyday code. You are receiving some data, and you are sending some data. Uh, I already said that. Uh, uh, so offset is running on Python 2.7, Python 3.3, uh, and PyPy. Uh, to do that, it's using on CPython, it's using Python Fiber uh, from Sagul. Uh, it's uh, on PyPy, it's running continue lets to, uh, to, to create the, the Go routine. Uh, it's using atomic locking, uh, using the uh, atomic operation that your system offer in GCC mostly. Uh, so uh, we are not locking the thread, we are doing some atomic lock, quite fast uh, locking, uh, using an integer and it's implemented its EFFI. Everything is abstract in a pros process class, uh, so I guess it could be also possible to, to run it on top of uh, AsyncIO, even if I didn't try. Uh, so here's the structure, you have three entities uh, in offset, you have uh, one thread, which is uh, in, a in a feature, a scheduler context, which is named P as process, and a goroutine, which is a uh, sending code. And what does the offset scheduler is when you are executing code, uh, it's adding a uh, go routing to the process, to the context, to the run queue, and executing it. And it does that for any execution that will be launched in a go routing. So uh, it, uh, it's stacking every execution code in a queue. The context live in the main thread, you have one context uh, per Python VM and uh, one context all, all the goroutines uh, in a red queue. Uh, in a queue is just a queue uh, where you are appending the new task and you are uh, popping from the left, from the top, uh, the, the task on the queue to be executed. Like this schema sh uh, shows, you are uh, one goroutine at a time in the process, in the context, and uh, the other uh, goroutine waiting. Um, to execute uh, system calls, uh, I didn't patch uh, like uh, Gevent does. So you are using socket, uh, but you don't know that your, your socket have been patched by uh, Gevent. Instead of creating a size call model where I'm decorating uh, each uh, system call. So uh, all uh, socket um, annotate uh, each function and say this, this, function, this function is blocking at some point and should be run as a system call. I'm, I'm doing that for most of the function of the sy system li library. And when si a system a call is uh, executed, it is done in its own thread. Because I know that this is a system call because I've patched it before. Uh, uh, if I would use um, PyPy STM, it would be quite easier because PyPy STM is quite the same system. They are decorating each function behind, and when they are running in the atomic, uh, things it could be uh, put out of the gill uh, and some system here I have my pool of threads if I'm making atomic it uh, it could be run in a, in a real thread and put out of the gill and uh, could be coming back at the end. Uh, so what happens when um, a syscall uh, is done so you have your growth in e executed um, it's put out of the queue the next one the next growth is executed while the go routing, the system call is executed in the feature, in the thread. And when it finished uh, the, to do the call, so for example, the data is coming back to your socket, the go routing is put back in the queue and executed the next time by the scheduler. Which is a pain here. Uh, the scheduler always wait for system call. If, if, I, if I have no more uh, go routing in the queue, and I have, a, I have system call running, uh, it, will, uh, it will wait about, uh, for all the system calls. Um, so uh, some example uh, from Python uh, on, the, on the left and uh, the same code in Go on the right because uh, I'm using the same kind of API. Uh, this is uh, the old code, the new code uh, that I will push tomorrow. Uh, don't have any more run like this, uh, it's run the main function. But 
So here we have a main function. We are launching a, a go routing saying world. Uh, we are launching uh, a function saying hello. The main function is launched as a go routing too. And the say function say uh, five times uh, she's sleeping. So when she's sleeping, this is uh, actually uh, sleep uh, imported from uh, offset. Uh, it's going back in the scheduler and uh, it's printing I and then when it comes back, uh, it prints the hello, uh, the, the text, sorry. So here you will find five times, hello world, hello world, hello world, hello world, executed in concurrent manner. And if you see the on the right, the same credit go, you have the same time slip, which is doing exactly the same, five times printing uh, as, uh, the, the text and the main function that is executed. Channels are fully implemented in, um, in Go, uh, in, Pi in Offset, oh sorry. Uh, so uh, the initial version of, uh, of the um, channels in Offset uh, are, are using, um, we are using a queue, a DQ uh, to be example, to be exact, to, 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 to pass the data. So basically, when I was creating a channel, I was creating a DQ uh, that was binded to the, to the scheduler. The new version using MMAP, and in using shared memory, and why I'm doing that is because the new version of Offset uh, that I'm releasing next week uh, is able to run on multiprocess and multi-machine too. So uh, when I'm running on multiprocess, I'm only sharing memory between processes and appending the binary data to it and passing the data to the back uh, to each process. So you can run uh, when you are running a uh, go routine, it can run on any process launch at the, at the beginning. So a channel works like this. When a sender or server uh, need to wait, the greeting is it is put out of the uh, running queue. Uh, so when you are starting to receiving, uh, it puts your greeting out of the uh, of the queue, and the next greeting writing uh, to the channel, appending to the queue, appending to the memory channel, uh, we put it back in the run queue. So uh, so you can have. While you are waiting for a message in the channel, someone can write it uh, in the same thread. Uh, when a message can be sent or received, a uh, target is put back in the run queue. Uh, concrete example. So uh, here we are doing a sum, and to, to do this sum uh, faster, uh, we are splitting it in two parts, and we are doing the sum concurrently in two uh, tasks. So we are launching the, the uh, two tasks. The first one uh, with the first part of the, of the array, and the second part with the second part of the array. And we are creating a channel between them. We are passing the same channel to uh, each function, to each task. The same function is uh, summing the data passed uh, in the array and sending back to the channel. Uh, and uh, in the main task, we are receiving on x the, the, the value of the channel, and we are receiving on y the value of the channel. So, sorry. Uh, so, when you print the result of x, y, you will have the sum of all the array uh, run uh, in uh, quite in parallel. It can be in parallel if you have more than two process launch, or uh, it, uh, runs, it is runs concurrently uh, on the same thread. And if you see the, the code in Go, this is quite the same. You have the same function summing uh, each part of the, tab uh, the array. And you are uh, sending the result of the sum to the channel. And uh, you are receiving the result of A on X on Y and summing the, and printing the result of the final sum. Uh, buffer channel are uh, also implemented. The buffer channel is a way to send more than one message as a, as a channel without blocking. And uh, the receiver will always block uh, on the other hand uh, to the value. So uh, to show an example, here we are creating a channel uh, with a buffer of two. We are sending one, we are sending two without blocking. And we are receiving. And at this point, we are blocking. We are receiving the value, and we are receiving the value. And we will print uh, one and two. And uh, same code in Go. Um, select is also <laughs> implemented. Uh, so select is working like uh, any select uh, for read and write events on uh, uh, on I/O operation. 
And um, here we are creating a, a simple algorithm to, 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 to print the uh, 10 first number of the Fibonacci function. And for that, we are creating two channels. We are creating one channel where we, where we, we receive the data and a quit channel where we are sending the quit when we are uh, receive uh, the all the value. And we are launching a task, uh, the function here, which is sending, uh, which receiving the 10 first value. And we are launching the Fibonacci function. And what we do, what we do here, we are passing 0, 1 to, uh, to x and y. And until we receive a quit, uh, we are uh, selecting if we can send the value or if we receive the, va uh, the quit. If we don't receive the quit, but uh, we, are we can send the value, so someone here uh, started to resave, uh, we are uh, adding the new value and sending back to the channel, etc. And when we save quit, uh, we will save quit. And we will print the 10 first value of the Fibonacci function. And this is exactly the same code. Uh, syntax is a little different in, in Go, uh, but uh, this is exactly the same code in Go. So uh, there are other models implemented from um, Go. Uh, all the synchronous API, uh, all the lock, the mutex uh, using atomic lock uh, are implemented. Uh, all the time functions are implementing. Timer, tick ticker, and sleep. Net and IO model are implemented, but will be released uh, tomorrow or on Tuesday. It depends if I'm tired or not. And uh, yeah. Now, what is changing from the current kernel line is that channel have been rewritten to use a map, uh, a full imp implementation using CFFI and working on uh, on Windows too. Uh, the serialization is on using DIL. By doing that, I can uh, recover the, for example, the code of a lambda function or a function, and pass it directly to another process uh, using the map. I can span on different processes and machine. Uh, and the thing is, uh, it I want to move more to the Julia language in terms of API rather than uh, sticking to the Go language API because I'm thinking that uh, Julia language is uh, a little more like uh, Python, but uh, with uh, parallel uh, and um, multiprocessing support uh, imp uh, created. And that's it. If you have any questions. Multiple yeah. Uh, how do you, did you get rid of the gil? So um, I'm, I removed the run function, like I said, uh, and I'm launching process, OS processes. And uh, you, you set the number of processes you can launch, and you can also launch a manager, so uh, you can launch dynamically a process too. Yeah. To what extent do you think this can be used in uh, production systems? Uh, I have a to uh, I have a small goal to use it uh, for some uh, some code myself uh, for for a customer. Um, I don't know. It's it's aims to be used in production at the end. Yeah, uh, there is uh, there are unit tests everywhere. So yeah. Sorry. Uh, not yet, um, but um, I looked the way AsyncIO uh, does uh, since uh, recently. They added some way to, to tag the function, uh, and I want to do the same so you can uh, recover, you can trust uh, the, the function in your code. Thank you.